You are listening to the Kinky Coach Podcast with Stephanie and Fox. Hey, Fox. Yeah. You've been a bad, bad boy. Nice boy. This show contains explicit content and is intended for mature audiences only. This is what happens when an innocent, successful mental health professional falls for a rugged, prior-deployed bad boy. You You get get one one hell of a ride. ride. I am very excited about this topic, and it was encouraged, or I guess not necessarily encouraged, but inspired by a fan question. So the question was, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Hey guys. Wait, 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 I'm not ready. Are you ready now? I'm ready. Okay. Stop it. I know what you're trying to do. (laughs) Hey guys, I've been married for three years and everything has been perfect. Unfortunately, she has completely stopped wanting to have sex with me. She swears she loves me and that she's still attracted to me, but she never wants to have sex anymore. Is our relationship salvageable? Ooh. Hmm. I get this question, or I get this a lot, but I wanted to talk about sexual dysfunction and how normal it is. So let me ask you, answer that question. Is his relationship salvageable? Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, are you cheating on me? Are you cheating on me? One. Two, is it not pleasurable to you anymore because of something I'm doing? Is it not pleasurable because it hurts? So a lot of questions come to mind that I would respond with if you came to me and told me this. Okay. Mm -hmm. But is it overall salvageable? Anything is salvageable if you want it to be. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. You and I went on a road trip recently hell yeah we did (laughs) and it was a nice road trip and we we went to go hang out with some friends some really nice friends that that i knew that you surprised me with i'm not gonna say that i knew i did surprise you i didn't tell you where we were going and what what it is we were going to do but i knew you needed a mental break i did and i knew that that these two friends of i so we're going to call them j uh, s and j s and j s and j not J and S? J and S, S and J. Okay. Whichever you want to, however you want to say it. I like them both equally. They're both equally awesome people. They are a lot We've of fun. We've known them for over a year now. Mm-hmm. And they are just down to earth, fun. Want They want everyone to have a good time. Extremely respectful. And I knew that they were the perfect people to bring you around because they don't give a shit. And you knew I needed something. And I knew you you needed a I don't give a shit weekend. And it was yeah. perfect. It was sexually awesome. It, I see our printer agrees. Yeah, our printer. It chimed in and said, yes, I was watching you through the little Epson, uh, obviously, app that NSA is oh, listening to okay. us on. Well, because my cell phone is connected to the printer. Oh, so the printer was agreeing with us. It, probably because it was listening in all that night. Yeah. It was a very sexually stimulating yeah. night. And chillaxed. It was relaxed, very relaxed. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. But on our trip, mm-hmm. we were listening to some podcasts. We were having some very deep dis- deep discussions. Mm-hmm. And I have an appreciation for my job. And I feel like my work is very important because, you know, as a counselor... People come to me with things that they don't go to the general public with. And and they'll go to their doctors as well. Unfortunately, we don't have specific classes in our grad school and even doctorate school for us to deal with sexual dysfunction. They mention it briefly, but it's up to us as counselors and as doctors and whatnot to go and get continuing education credits or classes outside of our regular training in order for us to become well-equipped with sexual dysfunctions, Hmm. sexual desires, all of that stuff. I've dedicated 
many, many, many hours to researching and to learning as much as I can about sexual dysfunctions, sexuality, sexual desires, you name it. But not everybody has that luxury. I can tell you that when I was going through medic school, that uh, or EMT school, I guess I, I, I should call it what it's really called, um, regardless of whether it's going for your B license or your advanced or your paramedic license, you don't get a whole lot of medical training on anything sex related. I, sexual injury, but not dysfunction. I don't think you no. would. Why would a medic need sexual dysfunction You would training? be surprised some of the calls that we get when we're on a box. Okay. Um, I have shown up to calls where, you know, we showed up and we run through the door and we're huffing and puffing and we have our oxygen in our bags and we're like, okay, what are we about to run into? And it is a couple and the husband or wife has a toy stuck inside of them or some type of mental health call. Or, mm. so, so we do get some like that. But we don't get the training. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Who do you think the women go to first? And I'm, I'm saying women in particular at this, at this moment. Where do the women go to get when they're having sexual dysfunctions? Where do you think they go? I would say either they go to their general practitioner or they go to their gynecologist. What if I told you that gynecologists have probably less than 12 hours of training in sexual desire, sexual dysfunction, and sexual anything. What would I say now that I've listened and, and researched some other stuff you put in front of me? would say I'm not surprised, but I was very surprised during our conversation, during, you know, during our road trip, that uh, I knew that doctors didn't because I have a lot of friends that are doctors, mm -hmm. but I did not, and I was very surprised to hear that gynecologists, especially since they deal specifically with the woman's vagina. So maybe you should probably know a little bit about that. Or well, they would, know all about the vagina. Well, I'm, I'm well dysfunction, so to speak. Because, so take men for instance, right? When a man has sexual dysfunctions, there's a lot of different people he can go to. There's actual specialists that he can go speak to. But I didn't realize how little resources were out there for women. Yeah, it was quite surprising, actually. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What I want to really do is normalize the sexual dysfunction because people come to me, they come to us, they go to their doctors and mm -hmm. they're like, well, you know, I'm having this issue. And this is females. I shouldn't say people, females, men have, they can go talk to their urologist. They can go talk to their doctors and they deal with sexual dysfunction a lot in, with men. Doctors deal with it a lot, but women don't really come out and do it and say things about it. There's almost, there's a stigma. There's this fear of I'm the only one. And honestly, that's not true because 43% of women experience some sort of sexual dysfunction in their lifetime. And 31% of men experience some sort of dysfunction in their lifetime. Sometimes it can get so bad that it becomes a disorder, the sexual arousal disorder, but that only is about 8% of the population, and that's the hypoactive sexual desire disorder. But that only becomes a disorder when it starts diminishing your quality of life. So you're saying it goes from a physical issue to a, a psychological or mental one? Sometimes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and is that because of the, the extent of time that it goes on so you I guess mentally train your brain to no longer like sex or appreciate it or you know all that kind of dissipates because of whatever it is you're dealing with pretty much like the prolong effect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also think about the people who don't have sex for years and years and years I don't ever think about those people <laughs> well, they're there <laughs> because I never want to be one of those people I doubt you that, will be that scares me a lot but there are those who don't have sex and the old motto, if you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. You are literally lose, excuse me, neural pathways in your brain if you're not using them. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So when I was a kid, I was told the more you use that, the more you're going to go blind. So yeah, is that true too? That's one of the many myths that you were told. Okay. I mean, I did it a lot, especially to the Sears catalog, uh, bra section at the time. I really, so I, I wasn't into butts just yet. 
Mm. What was the only type of porn I could get my hands on? The internet porn. wasn't the internet wasn't a thing back then. You couldn't go on to Pornhub.com or go to Playboy. You had Hustler magazines and Playboy magazines, and that's if your you know father, stepfather, grandpa, uncle, if you knew where their stash was, mm. and that, that's the only way you can get a hold of that. So, what was always laying around the Sears catalog? I would think what, Victoria's what, Secrets, but Victoria's Secrets didn't didn't uh, exist. exist back okay, then. Fredericks of Hollywood did, but again, those were magazines that you, most parents hid. With my mom, she didn't hide it. It was just in a drawer full of lingerie stuff for her to to order from. I gotcha. So I I was readily, I had readable access. Is that really a term? That's not a word. We'll go with it. Yeah, it's okay. I had easy access to the Sears catalog. The Sears catalog has women's clothing in it, bra section, panty section. Okay. Yeah. Well, back to the topic. Mm -hmm. And off of your... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I mean, I, that could be considered... No, it really can't. I was told I would have a sexual dysfunction yeah? of going blind if I kept using it the way I did. And that is one of the ways that sexual dysfunction can come into play if it's a mental mm-hmm. s- mental stigma or a mental blockage. I got another one. I was like 11 or 12, and I was masturbating so much with soap and forgetting to wash it all off. That a layer of soap literally built around my balls, my testicles, and it started to burn one day. And I really thought that I had just like done some major damage and I was too afraid to tell anyone about it. So I was putting ice down my pants, <laughs> like scratching my testicles against the carpet. Like, like a dog? Like, I can just see you. Yeah. But luckily that night when I took a shower... It like really obviously relieved it, and I realized, oh, you know, it's soap, whatever. That's my fault. Did but you ever tell anybody this story? I told my doctor because, and I didn't tell my doctor until I went into the military when I was at MEPS, and he's, you know, they asked a series of questions, um, and I said, you know, I may be sterile because I did this. <laughs> so you thought that made you sterile? <clears throat> yeah, I thought it overheated my balls, and uh, wow, goodbye, children. Yeah, so that's interesting. <laughs> yes. That's one of the many myths. Yeah. There are a lot of myths surrounding and misconceptions and just frankly, just misinformation surrounding Mm -hmm. our genitals Mm -hmm. and the use of them. I want to look for us to kind of look at some of the most common sexual dysfunctions in women and what they're caused from. Okay. But first, I want to, I guess, lead into that by saying women go to their, their trusted care physicians, whatever is gynecologist or primary, and talk to them about these issues, talk to them about their sexual issues. But when they are shut down in a nonchalant way, for example, so the woman goes to her doctor and she says, I'm not experiencing sexual satisfaction. There's, I have low libido, low sexual desire, whatever they want to call it. And if the doctor nonchalantly I mean, inadvertently shuts them down by saying, maybe you should just drink a glass of wine to relax. The woman is not going to talk about that to anybody else. Does that really happen often? Yes, it does. Interesting. Okay. And so once she's shut down, she thinks that she's the only one with this problem because, you know, the doctors told her, go have a glass of wine. Well, I'm sure she's had plenty of wine and it's just not helping. And so she feels stigmatized and she feels like there is something gravely wrong with her but that's just not true women experience this more frequently than we are talking about well so you know i've dated some doctors and some pas in the past and some nurses and i i guess this is really a topic we've never discussed honestly so i'm a little surprised to hear that a large majority of medical professionals would shut a woman down when when she said that i i guess would say okay let's do some blood tests let's you know explain it to me more let's create a profile on what it is you're experiencing and let's start you know putting check marks on the boxes and and try and figure out why well you're one of the very few because well especially if she was cute i'm sure (laughs) you would ask can i help you out with that i would (laughs) obviously There are four main factors Mm -hmm. that go into... Now, this is if you've had the blood test. 
if you are, if your um, in, endocrine endocrine system there we go is firing on all cylinders you have estrogen testosterone you can call it the endo system we do it all the time yeah well yeah whatever as long as everything is all your numbers are hitting everything's on par mm -hmm. then there's four main causes that kind of comes into that and that is of course just low sexual desire sexual arousal disorder orgasmic disorder yeah can you believe that some people can't have an orgasm and then painful intercourse now, these are disorders or these are well, these, sexual dysfunctions that arise? Well, these are sexual dysfunctions that arise, but they can turn into disorders if they're not taken care of. Okay. And the, remember, a disorder is when it's lasting longer than six months and it is gravely, or not gravely, but it is impacting your daily life. I really hate that term, by the way. Gravely? Disorder. Disorder. Oh. I think it's a nasty, well, very just negative word. So you want to call them dysfunctions? <clears throat> No, I mean if that's the that if if that is the official medical term under that research, well then we'll call it that. I'm just letting you know I actually hate hmm. the term disorder. Well, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Let's start with low sexual desire. Okay. We did a uh, not a podcast, a vlog about it. In the vlog, I talked about how sometimes you may not you may have low sexual desire because you're not having the type of sex that you want to be having. Right. What do you think that looks like for some couples? Well, I would even start and say maybe you're not having, maybe you're no longer attracted to your partner for some reason. And that's not always an aesthetic basis. That could be a mental, you know, a mental thing as well. But, you know, it could be that you're not being exploratory enough. I know there's a lot of people out there that, that missionary is the standard type of sex and doggy style is getting kinky. <laughs> Hey, Kinky Nation, do you need help with navigating the swinging lifestyle? Fox and I offer personalized coaching services designed specifically for your relationship needs. Are you the person that all your friends turn to when they have questions about sex? You should check out the Kinky Coach Sex Coach Certification Course and get paid for sex coaching instead of doing it for free. Just go to kinkycoach.com. Lastly, if you feel that you are in need of therapeutic services for your relationship or individually, please visit Beautiful Beginnings with an S, LLC.org for more information on the counseling services I offer. Okay, Kinky Nation, let's get back to the show. But that's, they're not having the style of sex that they want. Well, maybe one is, but the other is not. So, may, you know, so if we're talking about women specifically right now, there are a lot of men, especially in religious, right, type frame of minds mm -hmm. that believe Missionary sex is normal sex, and doggy style is getting a little crazy. Okay. So, um, and if the wife is seeking more than that, then obviously she's going to be dissatisfied and not want to engage in sexual practices anymore. With that partner. Mm -hmm. With that partner. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a big factor in not having and not being able to verbalize what you want due to shame, due to guilt. Right. Maybe even due to culture. I, that's that mm -hmm. was the word I was looking for, mm -hmm. and I could not get it to come out. Yeah, mm -hmm. the culture doesn't allow it. Right. So that can absolutely dissipate the desire for sex. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> the word. Did you just see the word like not come to my mind at all? I don't know. I mean, it just didn't. It just <clears throat> right out. So another one is another root cause. I guess I should say birth control pills medication can cause you to have a low sexual desire. Hmm. Interesting. Well, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of medications can change the chemical imbalance inside of your body into where your body is normally running on all cylinders in one fashion. And now you introduce right a different type of oil or gasoline. It's going to, it's going to work different. It's going to function differently. And perform differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the number one cause for low sexual desire in women? No. Stress. Okay. Stress. When women okay. are stressed, they have no sexual desire. Hmm. I, I guess I'm a lot more like a woman than I thought. <laughs> wow. Do tell. Well, you already know this. If I get overly stressed or I have bad shit going on in my head... Yeah, 
my little switch gets dialed, you know, let's say one to 10 gets dialed way back. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. We keep talking about sexual dysfunction, but do you know what the symptoms of sexual dysfunction are? Like I want everybody to understand what sexual dif- dysfunction truly is. So as a general term or sexual dysfunction, according to each function, like what, what do you mean? Well, I just, if someone thinking about, well, you know, is this normal? I, am I experiencing some sort of sexual dysfunction? So talk to me about if someone were to say, I have low sexual desire, mm-hmm. what would that, what would that mean to you? What would it mean to me? Yeah, to you specifically. It would mean that they, I mean, that they don't desire sex, but I would probably try and dive into why, you know, is it that they have low self-esteem for themselves? Because that could be a big one. I know, you know, most people, if they don't feel on top of their game or they don't feel sexy, then they don't want to have sex. Not And not because they don't desire the person, because they're embarrassed about themselves. Yeah. So they're afraid of the reaction they're going to get. So they just draw back. I would say also, you know, is it a physical feeling? Does it hurt? Does it create pressure? Does it... I'm sure there's many different feelings physically. And I'm I'm not a woman, obviously, but I'm sure that pain or discomfort... Mm -hmm. That goes along play. more with dysfunction. Okay. So we're just kind of dealing with a low sexual desire. What about mm-hmm. anxiety surrounding sexual performance? Like they're not good enough for their partner? They get in their head and they start okay. thinking, I'm not good enough. My partner's had this many partners previously. I've only had him or her and mm. I I don't know what I'm doing. And so how can I please them? And then they get into their own head and they start psyching themselves out and their sexual desire starts diminishing. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. You know, another one, Hmm. absence of sexual fantasies. Like people that don't fantasize? People who don't fantasize. Why wouldn't you not fantasize? That's a great question. Well, and I shouldn't say most. Let me rephrase that. There are many people who do not have any sexual fantasies. Wow. I, shit you not, have a couple that I'm working with right now. When I asked them, what are your sexual fantasies? Both of them just stared at each other blankly and was like, we don't, I don't, I don't even know. And I asked them, so what are we trying to achieve? If we, if we don't have a goal or what we're, any sort of idea of what we're trying to to achieve, how do we know when we get there? And so I had them create a list of sexual fantasies. What are your top 10 sexual fantasies? So is it that they didn't know as a couple what their fantasies were because they didn't really discuss it or individually, individually. they had no desire or fantasy of their own but individually how can that be possible it's very possible hmm. why is that baffling to you because i don't think i have ever met somebody that i know of that doesn't desire sex or fantasize in some way about sex yeah there are people out there who do not, hmm. and that contributes to a low. I, we haven't. I've never even had a client, but you see way more clients. I than see, I do. Yeah, yeah, I see a lot more than you do. But yeah, yeah, I deal with a lot of clients, or not a lot. I shouldn't say a lot, but I deal with several clients who can't, or they, and I want, I want to say they can't. They have not thought about fantasizing. Maybe they did when they were younger, and as they grew older, it just left. I wonder is that because their sex life to that point was just boring and mundane or I don't know no I I mean I know that it happens Mm -hmm. I have just never personally met somebody or people that I know have just gone along with it if that was the case for them and tried to lie about it I mean or fib their way through or well think about it if you if someone if you were sitting down and someone says what's your fantasy and you've never had a fantasy before Mm -hmm. and you don't want to feel like you're not quote unquote normal, whatever the hell normal is. And so you, Oh yeah, I fantasize, but you know, to yourself Mm. that, yeah, maybe I don't. And so it takes me a minute to get the couples to, to admit that they don't have fantasies. So that's still interesting to me because normally when I talk to people about their fantasies, we get very detailed 
And if you were trying to pretend, how do you pretend a fantasy in great detail? I don't know. I mean, I'm talking Mm -hmm. about for mine. I don't know who you talk to. Mm -hmm. Just other clients we've had in the Mm -hmm. past. But, But again, I've never... I've never had that response. Yeah. I've never had a blank response. I've never had a response of we don't or I don't know. Yeah. Um, at all. It's usually, oh, that's easy. And they grab a piece of paper and I get 10 to 12 to 20 different things on a piece of paper. And then we talk about I each I couldn't one. even get one out of this couple. Wow. That was their do, homework Do they the enjoy week. sex? Very much so. So they enjoy sex with each other. Mm-hmm. And they have sex regularly? They do. But they don't have fantasies about sex. Not at to all. The, not to that point. And I really... F- that's... Wow. Yeah. I, I that's, really feel like it was a cultural, maybe slight religious aspect to it that mm-hmm. they felt that it was impure and proper to fantasize and to have thoughts of sex outside of the bedroom. It was just... There's, there's that cultural... I shouldn't say cultural. There are some cultures who have that ingrained in them and I, I'm I can't speak for them but I would I would feel that they were more prone to being that couple okay so hmm. so that brings me to my next question people often ask us is my sex drive normal have you got that question mm-hmm. yeah oh yeah for many many of times and I just tell them what mine is and then they go yep I'm normal <laughs> well that's not what I do <laughs> I do <laughs> I feel like it's an individual Mm -hmm. uh, perception of whatever normal. And I can't define normal because there is no such thing as normal. Right. But a healthy sex life. Well, let me ask you. what What is a normal sex drive to you? I mean, I can only base it off of my sex drive. Well, that's not true because Mm -hmm. I know that my sex drive is above the norm. So, um, you know, I would say... Two, three times a week from from clients we've had, people we've talked to, seems to be the average sexual activity-wise, you know, for anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. Yeah, I would say that that is probably average from, again, people we've been around, I've been around, and, and people that I've talked to. Now, I, I don't personally, would not be happy with that average, but... yeah. That is, I think, what the average is. And, you know, you got to throw everything else in there because there's times where you and I end up only having sex three times in a week because of schedules and a bunch of other nonsense. Life. Life get, gets in the it way. It gets in the way. It doesn't mean the desire's not there. But by 9 o'clock, after recording a show, recording a vlog, you've been working, I've been working all day, you know, I worked out, you worked out, we get home, we eat, then we have more work to do on with this company. And then nine, 10 o'clock rolls around. And sometimes you and I just look at each other and we hug and kiss. And we're like, good night. Do we even kiss? <laughs> like sometimes we don't even kiss. Um, I think for, yeah, I think normally, uh, I don't know. Well, we haven't been, yeah. There's times that we don't even kiss. Oh, we're so I'm tired. I'm glad you're keeping track. Oh, I do. No, uh, I'm just kidding. No. I'm sure you do. I do. I'm I have sure a little ticker do. by the bed. I'm, I knew it. Yes. Yeah. No. But you're right. I mean, the schedules don't match. And so sexual yeah. desire, but it's mm-hmm. it's ever-changing. And it but goes... I still want to have sex. I'm just so tired that right. I'm just like, God, I want to have sex, but I'm so tired. Mm-hmm. And so cuddling with you suffices. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The next thing I want to kind of move into mm-hmm. when it comes to sexual desire. Should you meet your your partner's sexual needs at the expense of your own Ooh, so I think you need to, man, that, that is a catch 22 question. It is. Because, yeah, I know. That's why I'm asking you. Because personally, I believe that yes, you need to provide for your partner what they need. But at the same time, if it's going to damage you physically or mentally, then you need to come to a compromise. Mm-hmm. That's just my personal feeling. Not some people are going to disagree with that and go, if it compromises you at all, that's not okay. I push back and I disagree and I say, well, then are you really providing for your partner what they need? I mean, everything is a compromise. So when you say a compromise, mm-hmm. can you explain that just a little bit more? Let's give a hypothetical couple, right? The male is born in 
very busy New York City where they have a lot of, it's a melting pot. He's exposed to a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different sexual partners, etc. right? So he ends up marrying a small town Southern girl who was born very religious mm. um, and was taught and believes in her own culture that you only have sex after marriage and sex is missionary and it is meant to show physical love for your husband, but also create children. And that is it. So she is very two dimensional when it comes to sex. And he is almost fifth dimensional, right? Okay. They come together. If they're going to love each other, stay together, they need to both equally fulfill each other's needs. So he needs to understand her culture and what she's comfortable with. And they need to discuss that and vice versa. She needs to understand that he needs more than just missionary, you know, once a month. That's not going to be acceptable to him. And if you love each other and you want to maintain a healthy sexual relationship with your partner, you need to compromise. You, you need to figure out what that, what that word means to you in the first place and, and, and sit down and discuss it. And not just once. And this is multiple, you know, this is going to be multiple, multiple conversations over a very long period yeah. of time. Communication is key. Right. There's many research studies. This is uh, from the Kinsey Institute, actually, that shows. Wait, how do you say it? Kinsey Institute. Oh, okay. I thought you said something else. Oh. Okay. That says, or that has identified people who constantly sacrifice their own needs in order to make their partners happy are often miserable and tend to have very low self-esteem. Hmm. And on top of that, it is re, studies have shown that it is very unlikely that the partner even notices their sacrifice. Interesting. It's that me, me, me type of mentality. You have to find a balance mm -hmm. that compromise you're talking about. Yes. Agreed. You don't, you always tell me, don't take one for the team. Well, in life, don't take one for the team. Mm -hmm. Don't do it for the sake of somebody else. If it's going to put you in a position to where you don't feel happy and satisfied. Right. What if you have to tell your partner no? What if you have to say no to your partner? Do you think that would hurt their feelings? Mm, sure. I mean, it, it has a potential to hurt their feelings. It has the potential to turn them off. It has the potential to make them think that you're not interested in what they want. It has a potential to do a lot of things, mm -hmm. but I think if you're going to say no, just saying no is not the way to go. Okay. You need to discuss that. Well, why do you want this? Why do you want to put it into my butt? This is why. <laughs> Always okay. goes to the butt with you. Did you know that that make? I'm afraid of this and this is why I'm afraid and this is how I feel about it. And this is the research I've done and I've given it a lot of thought since you've brought it up. Show them that. You're not just going no and shutting it down. Show them that you have given it some thought. You've given it some attention and you're not comfortable with it. Yeah. And, and then explain why you're not comfortable. I'm not a big fan. As you know, I, I, I talk sometimes. I over talk. So, really? Yeah, I can do that. Oh. Um, but I rather do that than give you one, one word responses. That's true. Because that leaves, that leaves the imagination to, run to turn on. Yeah. Crazy. And well, good Lord. <laughs> going back to trying to satisfy your partner at your own expense, mm -hmm. come up with an alternative. You don't have to flat out say no, but come up with an alternative of something that you're willing to try that may be not necessarily... You know, okay, well, since we're using your anal, your butt So example. before your penis goes in my butt, let's try a butt plug first. Or maybe rubbing, rimming my, my you know, something. Oh, I do that to my partners without them even, but, without asking permission all the time. I understand that, but <laughs> that's not, may not be normal for this couple, so start small. So I just totally now, the next female that listens to this, and she's like, oh, I like Fox. Oh, maybe I don't. I just screwed myself. Yeah, well. Oh, well. If, if they still like you or they still like us after all of this. I'm definitely going to take my thumb and rub it against your butthole. It's going to happen. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. probably true. But mm -hmm. anyway, just start small and find that compromise instead of just flat out saying no. Yeah, I agree. 
One thing that we haven't really talked about is the history of abuse or trauma and how it affects sexual desire. Okay. That uh, there's a lot of adversity that can be traced back to your childhood experiences. I feel like we should touch base very quickly on this because this can be an entire show by itself. It can be. Mm. And I just want to really caution people that some, if they have experienced something as a child, a sexual trauma, Trauma. thank Mm -hmm. you, a sexual trauma as a child, that they can view intimacy as a danger or a threat. Correct. So anybody who's experiencing that, I want to make sure that they go and speak to a counselor, whether it's an individual counselor, couples counseling, something to that level, because they can condition themselves to enjoy sex. They can raise their sexual desire, their sexual intimacy, and they can remove that threat, but it's going to take a little bit of work. So I'm going to encourage their partner to do something different. And I'm not saying I'm negating Stephanie by any stretch of the imagination because I agree with her. But as someone who has had multiple partners now that have had sexual trauma, I can tell you what I do and what I suggest you do. One, your partner has to be 100% honest with you about what took place. And that could be very hard. It could be very emotional. And you want to be careful when you do that because you don't want them to relive their trauma per se in a negative way. Mm-hmm. So... If they're willing to express to you and open up about what took place, please do not push further into that. You don't need a play-by-play narrative. Stay away from that. I've never told you all about mine. I mean, we, there's, just, there's no need to. And I'll never ask. I don't need to ask. Mm-hmm. Two, in no way, shape, or form should you make them feel bad for what they experienced. Absolutely. Um, Don't dive into a million questions like, well, what were you wearing? What did you say? I mean, these are very negative impacting questions that almost create blame. Stay away from that. Yeah. The third thing is you might have desires. You need to use, and I'm just going to say this, whether it's professional or not, use your damn common sense. Absolutely. When, when, When you're approaching your partner, use your common sense. If you know you want to engage in activity, that may adversely affect them or be close to what they experienced, don't just try it. You you need to talk to your partner Mm -hmm. and say, hey, I know this happened to you. I've been thinking about trying X, Y, and Z. How do you feel about that? What do you think? And talk it out. Maybe not just talk it out. Talk it out. Role play it out very slowly, softly. If they're in, in some type of counseling, have them talk to their counselor about it. Yep. Be fully engaged in that entire process. And and lastly, no matter what happens, support them. You know, I know that if if I ever did anything that I thought Stephanie reacted to because of what she has experienced in her past, we would probably stay away from that behavior, if not indefinitely, for a very long time. Again, I don't want to sound like a jerk. I don't think you're sounding like a jerk. I think you're giving really sound yeah. advice. But use your common sense and be supportive because sexual trauma, it's its nasty. And, you know, I, and I'm going to tell you from a law enforcement background, I, I can't tell you <laughs> some of the stuff that I've seen. And from a medical background, as a medic, I, I it infuriates me, some of the shit that I have yeah. seen. Be lighthearted with your partner. Be caring and be supportive. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I do want to do a a show on sexual trauma and how to mm. heal through sex. Okay. Yeah. yeah so I we'll talk more about that in the future. Mm-hmm. We did touch on this, this next topic a little bit earlier, but religion and how it impacts sexual desire. Being from the South, being from the True Love Waits movement, can really attest to this phenomenon. As a young girl, child, teen years, it was beat into me that masturbation was a sin, sex, any kind of sex outside of marriage, I was going to be a promiscuous whore and no man was ever going to love me and I'll never get a good man because, oh my gosh, you've had some sort of sexual activity outside of marriage. True love waits 
if he really loves you, he'll wait for you. And I had that beat into me day after day, year after year. And that really can affect your sexual libido. I really thought you were going to go somewhere else, but but we're here. So let's let's go with it. So I've been with probably one of the most, actually two different partners. She was Mormon. Mm-hmm. And she was, oh, I don't even know how to say it. She, I mean, she was Mormon. Like, she was the real deal. So she was a traditional Mormon. Very. Okay. All the way to the point that when we started dating, you know, she told me, hey, once we get married, I really only want you to have two other wives. I mean, we're talking super traditional Mormon. She was a fucking freak. <laughs> Period. Mm-hmm. You know, did I maybe seduce her into sex? Maybe. Maybe just a little bit. But do I think it was easier because she had never been sexual? I do. And once that Pandora's box was open, forget it. There was no mm-hmm. shutting it. Then I was with, and actually both women I've been with have kind of been the same. They kind of pushed back, pushed back. But once we started having sex, it was, it was like freaks come out at night, man. Mm-hmm. I mean. Well, a lot of the religion aspect of it is associated with shame and guilt. Mm-hmm. And they, I say they as in the, the religious entity makes the child or the teen feel that they are doing something just profoundly wrong Hmm. by even thinking about sex outside of marriage. Yeah. And I know you tell me about this, but like, I didn't grow up that way. I I didn't grow up, you know, so I grew up with Catholicism, Mm -hmm. but my mother was not very sold on that idea. So by the time I was, I think, 10 or 11, we had stepped away from the church altogether. And my mom was very open. And being from California, the porn cap of the world. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, pretty much everybody was open. You know, and if you went to church, it was not a big deal. Like people didn't tease you or bother you. But also if you didn't go to church, it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Being from Texas, mm-hmm. the South... It was a big deal. Right. And And you're not just from Texas. You're like supposedly from the true Texas. I'm from East Texas. Oh. Well, what's the true Texas? I I keep hearing this. The Uh, heartbeat of the true Texas. I see this term everywhere. uh, The heartbeat of Texas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, That's East Texas because if you think about where the heart is... Okay. Like I said, you're from the true Texas. I mean, Texas is Texas, (laughs) but... I'm from East Texas. So it was beat into us Mm -hmm. day in and day out that, you know, that sex is not a thing. So I felt a lot of shame and a lot of guilt around it. And that's why I have a hard time masturbating Mm -hmm. because I feel so shameful and guilty and dirty because that's what I was told. I mean, you didn't feel too guilty. You've told me about your past. Not about masturbation. Masturbation, the first time I've ever, like, masturbated was that time I sent you a video a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. That was... Well, you're t- yeah, you're talking about masturbation. I'm, yeah. I'm talking about sex. No, I'm talking about masturbation. That's what oh, I just said. I okay. had such a hard time masturbating because... I, I don't masturbate because it's something that was just so shameful. Right. As far as, like, sex, yeah, no, I, I rebelled against the church. Mm-hmm. That's what I wanted to do, so I did it. Let's move into... What are the treatments for low sexual desire? There is, there are treatments. All doom and gloom, like it's just, we are 100% talking about all this low sexual desire, but is there hope? I mean, there's always there's hope. There's always hope, There's always right? hope. Yeah. I mean, come on. So, you know, there are all sorts of creams and lubricants and toys and work books and workshops and and now there are pills pills and coaching and therapy and 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 i mean the and goes on the and and goes on on on. forever Mm -hmm. the what i what i love about the and going on forever is that it's not a one size fits all you can customize whatever you need to customize your Uh, I don't want to call it treatment because it's not treatment. I don't want to call it recovery because they're not recovering from anything, but their journey, 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 their journey, their healing journey Okay. to look any way you want it to look. Well, I guess healing is kind of negative in this 
also if you really think about it because then you're you're claiming you were broken. And, yeah, I think journeys. And that's not true either. I don't you know. think you're broken at all. No, not at all. So throughout your journey, you just have to find what works for you. Mm-hmm. You there, have to find your own sexual appetite. And there are times it's going to be ugly. Hmm. It's not going to be pretty. Dealing with some of the things that you have to deal with to overcome your baggage that you're bringing into a sexual relationship, sometimes it's not pretty and mm-hmm. sometimes it hurts. But you have to deal with that and process it and discuss it and get over it so that you can move through it. Right. And if you're not moving through it, all you're doing is putting a Band-Aid on it and it's going to resurface at another time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, sexual, low sexual desire can be treated. There are several ways. You know, I think if you ever had low sexual desire, I would just tie you up to the bed. And, uh, yeah, I think that would fix your problem. Really? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean... Because it's one of your fantasies. Your fantasies. It is. <laughs> yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. I just want to have some encouragement to, to women, specifically women listening to this today. We're going to get into low sexual desire. And we already kind of did with um, the erectile dysfunction uh, show that we talked about that can contribute to low sexual desire for men. But I really want to focus on you know what we can do for the women in all aspects of their life, whatever they're going through. Because let's just face it, women's hormones are all over the place, all the time. Our vaginas have a mind of their own. Sometimes they're wet, sometimes they're dry. Y'all be cray-cray. Sometimes they want sex, sometimes they don't. Mm. And then you throw in menopause and we have a whole other beast to deal with. But there's so much hope Mm -hmm. for a healthy, productive sex life. Well, and there's also surgeries too. Because, you know, if we're talking about dysfunction or... Other sexual issues. I mean, there's other things out there, Mm -hmm. right? There are. There are medical issues to do with your labia and your clitoris and your cell walls, your vaginal walls, and on and on and on. I got to tell you, I'm glad that I have a penis. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yes. It sticks out. Anything wrong with it, I can see it for the most part. (laughs) Yep. It's... It doesn't hide inside of my body. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. Well, women yeah. also, I mean, overall, women have a lower sexual desire than men, generally. Do they, though? Statistically speaking, yes. Hmm. Okay. I wonder what the lifestyle would say about that. But the lifestyle is a small population. Hmm. It's bigger than you think. I understand that, hmm. but... Actually, it's bigger. it's bigger than a lot of people want to allow it to be. Think about that for a second. I mean, I agree. Mm -hmm. I just want to really hit home the fact that women's sexuality is a combination of mental, physical, social. There's just not one simple treatment. What about men? Well, men is one of our probably mental elements that cause us to have low sexual desire because they give us so much shit all the time. (laughs) Is that how that works now? No. Uh Uh-huh. Well, little, little, being a little sexist, are yeah, we? Yeah, sexist. Mm-hmm. No, we're going to talk about men. I, re- I want to get into that in a, in a different... Totally different show. Totally different show yeah. where we talk about men's sexual desires. Okay. But That's we're, we're going to focus on the women today. Mm-hmm. Okay. In closing, and do you have any questions? Hmm. Last comments. Comments, yes. What would you like to comment? Uh, you know, I know there's a big movement for women power, etc. And I'm not going to dive down that rabbit hole but i but i am gonna say this as a man who enjoys a woman to be my equal Mm -hmm. don't be afraid to be yourself sexually mentally career-wise what have you not not even just talking about sexuality don't be afraid to be you yeah i think that would go a long way because i think that a lot of things that happen men and women with us Honestly, your mental health has a lot to do with your physical body. Absolutely. They both affect the same. So if you're happy, things are going well, you are probably going to be more sexually expressive. If things are not going well, you're not happy, you think something's wrong, etc., then it's going to be obviously the latter. So just be yourself. Be your beautiful self that you are. Because, I, you know, I, I can tell you, I can almost, not all the time, like, I'm not a big fan of bullshitting 
Uh, yes, and I, I don't can second and I, that. And I don't care if it's politically correct or not. I can't. I'm not going to sit here and say I can look at all women and find something beautiful because that's not true. But I'm going to say I can look at most women and I can find something beautiful about that woman. So just remember that, right? Women were meant to be beautiful, regardless of what religion or religious status you have, because I'm not very religious anymore. I used to be, but I'm not anymore. Women were created, in my opinion, in a very beautiful way, uh, a lot more than a man, period, than men in general that's why i'm bisexual women have <clears throat> oh they're fucking gorgeous <laughs> i mean i like them what, what can yeah. i say mm-hmm. i want to end by saying that women have reactionary sexual desires okay. meaning more than not women need some sort of stimulation to really get the juices flowing so to speak okay i want to say do not skip the foreplay So like when I grab you by your hair and tug you into my body? Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, more like, moreover, just women often will not experience the desire, quote unquote desire, until they've been... Tickle the brain before you tickle the tail. Yeah, I mean, they need to be Mm -hmm. aroused. Mm -hmm. And so don't skip the foreplay. Foreplay is very important. Right. And I think that there's a lot of times that we don't have time for it. We have kids in the next room or, you know, the baby's crying or, you know, I'm tired. Make time for it Hmm. because that will really increase your sexual desire. Yeah, for sure. And flirt. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. John Gottman raves about the six second kiss. He talks about how important that is to every day as soon as you see your partner when you get home from work to give them a six second kiss. Six seconds kiss. Interesting. Because that just helps you reconnect and you're not, if you, it just, there's so much to that, to that kiss. Why six seconds? What, what's with the six seconds? Just gives you some time to, because think about it, you go, that's what, you know, you're not really doing anything. Hey, how are you doing? But if you take the time to think about, I'm going to kiss my partner for six seconds, I'm going to really just get into it. You're taking the time to invest in that person. I don't know what it is about six seconds. Maybe Mm. it just sounded good. But the time limit is you're investing that in your partner. And you're taking the time to only focus on that kiss. Okay. For at least six seconds. I think that pretty much wraps it up for me. I don't wrap it up with you, though. Oh, that's true. We don't have to. (laughs) Mm -mm. (laughs) (laughs) No, we don't. (laughs) Well, we have uh, some fun trips coming up that we can't wait to share with our listeners. Absolutely. And more to come. Oh, so there we are on our road trip. Oh, boy. We get to S&J's house. Well, so I, so I, I don't tell Stephanie a thing. I just tell her, hey, we're going to go on a, a, a two-day little trip. Even though I figured it out. And uh, toot your own horn over there. I am. And just throw some clothes in the bag. We're going to get the hell out of here. You need a break, a mental break. And uh, we're going to go. So for a couple of days, she's just like, well, what are we doing? Well, what kind of clothes do I need? What this? What this? <laughs> so she's, so trying to, she's trying to investigate. And I'm just looking at her. I was like, I'm not answering any of your questions. I refuse. Uh, I'm not even going to give you the slightest hint of what we're doing. So we get to S&J's house. And we... Go out to dinner, mm-hmm. right? Well, we had planned a wine tasting that we found out wasn't a true wine tasting. Yeah, it kind of fell through. Yeah, it was. Well, it was bring your own wine, and I'm like, well, then why is it called a wine tasting? That doesn't make sense. Why would I want to taste my own wine? <laughs> I don't know. I, it was I very know. awkward. I don't know if yeah. that had something to do with COVID, and they can't open up. I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's very possible. I, I'm not sure either. But the the marketing was misplaced, misleading, Mis- misleading. Yeah. So we end up going to a really awesome restaurant anyway in Lubbock, Texas. Yeah. Um, do you remember the name of that restaurant? Because it, it was really damn good. The Funky Chicken or? The Funky Chicken? <laughs> That's a dance, baby. I don't know. What was it? <laughs> Hold on. I can look it up real you quick. You look it up. So we get there. We have a couple of drinks. We're being relatively good because our friends know a lot of people. In and um, yeah, we were he, being... he is in a certain job that he's a very prominent figure, yeah. 
So, and he, he could care less actually that the night. The funky door. The funky door. Yeah. So he kind of looks around and he, and he tells his wife like, well, we don't know anyone here. So who cares? Like he's ready to have some fun. I could tell where she's more concerned for him, you know, so which that was good. She was protecting him. Uh, probably cause she knows how we are and we just don't care. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's something about having your face on the internet you know, wrapped into lifestyle and alternative relationships. And, yeah, you just and kind of, you're out there. You're just like, for yeah, sex positive people. It, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, we don't care anymore. We had some really good food, a couple of drinks, you know. That was uh, delicious food. It was really good food. Man. So if you're ever in Lubbock, Texas, Lubbock, if I can talk, Lubbock, Texas, what's it called again? The Funky the Door. The Funky Door. Go check them out. I personally suggest the tacos. They were phenomenal. Yeah. Crab cakes is what I had, and they were delicious. <laughs> they were still good. Mm-hmm. Everyone's food looked awesome, and it smelled great. They 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 are heavy pouring. They are heavy handed. Yeah, they are heavy handed with I alcohol like that. too. So, so we do this, and then they're like, "Well, what are we going to do after?" And I cut to the chase. I'm like, "Let's cut the bullshit. <laughs> Who the hell wants to try and get naked by midnight? Let's do it now." Mm-hmm. So they agree. We all run to the house, and Jay has built this playroom. An extension oh. of his garage. And it's they so have, amazing. Yeah, they have like, I don't know, hundred, hundreds, hundreds of toys. Well, okay, probably about a hundred toys. Maybe would, not hundreds, yeah. but about a hundred toys. All these toys, you know, lights, the whole nine. I mean, it's they did a really good job at, at setting this thing up. And then right outside is a, a jacuzzi. So I, I don't remember if we hopped in the jacuzzi for yeah we hopped in the jacuzzi first no we didn't no we didn't y'all tied me up first <laughs> that's right so we end up tying her up uh, so me. if you are on any of our adult beverage websites okay so any of the three lifestyle websites or four now that we use go check that out because I may have or may not have posted did you post a picture I, I posted a collage three pictures of that night. Did you? I did. I have not seen um, this. And they are ultra sexy pictures. Now I'm going to go about look. Yeah. So obviously you can find us. It's the Kinky Coach or the Kinky Coach and her Silver Fox. Mm-hmm. Go check it out for sure. They're awesome pictures. Uh, it was a not, lot of fun. Yeah. And if you're not on these adult beverage websites. Oh, wow. Ours, this is a, quite the collage. See? Wow. Then go to our website, kinkycoach.com. And that's coach with a K. And sign up to be on our, on these websites, yeah. okay? And this way you can you can check it out. You can check out what we're talking about. And if you don't, well, to your loss, you can just pretend to visualize what you actually can visualize. Oh, so man. we end up tying Stephanie up, all of us touching her. So she's blindfolded, headphones on, can't hear, see anything. All she can do is feel and smell. Uh, so eventually we take her down. And then we go into the hot tub. Um, hang out in the hot tub for a little bit. Things start moving more towards sex. So then we're kind of like, okay, sex and water is that, that was fun. I guess when you were like a kid, but now we, we all know that it doesn't feel the same. So we're like, fuck this. Let's go back into the playroom. So we end up playing till, Oh, I don't know. One in the morning. Uh, one. I, yeah, it, was like, it? it was about one, one, one thirty something like that. Pretty late. It was pretty late. And it was, yeah, it was pretty just, late. It was an overall good time, but she needed it. I did. She needed to just relax and be used and not have to worry yeah. about anything. Exactly. It was very nice. I appreciate that. Thank mm-hmm. you for doing that. Yeah. So it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, and obviously a big shout out to our friends, Janice, S and, S and J. S and J. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Our crazy, crazy friends. We will know them for a, probably a very long time. We will. For sure. So that is the extent of my storytelling on our trip to well, Lubbock. And mm-hmm. our next sex capade mm-hmm. is to nashville is it now to see some of our sexy friends oh that's right yeah we are going to nashville tennessee coming up on uh, thursday august 6th right yeah and then we will be there august 8th because we're driving so we're going to like arkansas we're gonna stay the night then to tennessee yep we're taking our time and we'll be in nashville for what two or three days three days four, four days three days Three yeah, days. Three days. Mm-hmm. Look, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday. We're coming Monday. back. Yeah, but we're not leaving till Monday afternoon. Yeah, we're leaving Monday afternoon. So, so really, we're 
we're there, there for four for, days for four solid days. Yeah. yeah. So if you are in Nashville, Tennessee, hook up with us. Yeah. Link up with us. And if you're wondering, well, how do we link up with you? Go to the website. Yes. Get a profile on one of these <laughs> adult beverage. Adult, that's my term. Well, adult I can beverage use it. Website. Yeah. And, and then send us a message. Absolutely. Yeah, we look sure. forward to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get off here. Yeah, let's roll out. It's been a long day, it and I'm been. sick and tired of technology. Yep. yep. We'll talk to you soon, Kinky right. Nation. Have Good night. night. Hey, Fox. Not again. Why don't you tell them where they can find us? Oh, so you can find us on the book face. Facebook. Yeah, that thing. Uh, at the Kinky Coach. Or you can find us at any of the adult beverage websites. You like that? I do, yeah. The... Yes, yes, because you're tasty getting oh, you're thirsty yeah. yes thirsty uh, so you can look for either luna underscore and underscore logan or you can look for the kiki coach and her the silver, silver fox. fox yeah so thank you for listening and we hope you have a very sexy evening have a good night you are listening to the kinky coach podcast with stephanie and fox